I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, amen, guys. I'm so humbled and just excited to have this opportunity to be with you guys and, and sharing God's word. But for those of you who don't know me, I am the outreach pastor here at this church, at Hollywood Community Church. I'm also privileged enough to be the husband of the lovely young lady that just finished singing to us, Jennifer Miller. And we've been blessed with three wonderful kids, Serenity, Tyus, and Leah. You usually see them running around all over the place after, before, during church. Those are our three, and we're blessed to have them. Amen? Well, uh, the first and foremost and the most important and, and biggest of all, I would say, about myself is that I am very blessed and excited and happy to be a part of such a wonderful team of pastors, Brian, Jose, and, and, uh, and Pastor Brad. Amen? And so the only thing I would ask of you guys is just to remind me after this service to go to those guys and get the gifts they promised me for saying those nice things about them. <laughs> If you could with me, uh, look at your program. Take a, take a look at your program, and we are going to look at this Apostles' Creed. As a matter of fact, and as I, I happen to leave mine, but we'll. What I want to do is I want to read the Apostles' Creed up until, I want you to follow with me. I'm going to read. You don't have to read along, but we're going to read the Apostles' Creed up until the statement that we're going to focus on today. And the Apostles' Creed reads as this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary. Now, if that initial line sounds familiar, well, that's because two weeks ago, Pastor Brian did such an excellent job of describing and teaching and educating us on who exactly God the Father is in his nature and who he is to us. And that second part there, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Savior, last week, as we said already, Brad did such an excellent job of discussing, telling, and teaching us who Jesus Christ is exactly to us. This week, it is my responsibility to delve into this phrase, Jesus Christ, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit by the Virgin Mary. Let's pray. Most gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for blessing us with this brand new day and, and brand new chances here. And we would ask you that you would open up our ears and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us, to allow us to receive your blessings, allow us to be in, in your perfect will on today, Lord God. I pray that you would bless us with the spirit of gratitude, knowing that you've privileged us to be here, to sit under your word freely, without threat of hurt, harm, or danger. And now, Lord, that you would use your servant as an extension of your love to your people in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you could, in your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew, the first chapter, and we're going to go 18 through 23. Now, as I said before, we're going to discuss Jesus Christ being born of the Holy Spirit by the Virgin Mary. And by the time we finish today, I hope that you have a grasp of two questions or an answer for two questions. And those two questions are, 
how did this come about? How did this happen? How was Jesus Christ, our Savior, born of a virgin? And number two, what exactly does this mean for me here now today? Let's go to God's word. Matthew 18 and 1 reads as this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now right away in this first verse, there's two things that jump out at me. There's two things that I notice in this verse right away. Number one, Joseph and Mary were betrothed. So Joseph was set to be married to Mary. Now, the, the last term in this verse, from the Holy Spirit, is made evident to us as readers, but it's not evident to Joseph, who's there in the midst of it. So Joseph knows and understands the part of her being pregnant, but he doesn't know and understand. He hasn't realized that this is of the Holy Spirit. So right away, I'm thinking, oh boy, Joseph, what a rut you seem to be in right now. What a hard time you must be having managing, managing and thinking and taking this all in. And Joseph won't realize this of the Holy Spirit term until verse 20. You see, verse 19, he's struggling with this right now, and he won't find out that this child is of the Holy Spirit until verse 20. So let's just hope that Joseph can hold on until we get to verse 20. We'll discuss also that term from the Holy Spirit is a big deal here. From 18 to 23, from the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ being from the Holy Spirit is an impactful term, is an impactful phrase, and we'll delve deeper as we go along. Verse 19 says this, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, this verse proves what we just discussed in the last verse, right? Because Joseph is having a difficult time taking this all in, to the extent that he is now considering putting Mary away, divorcing her quietly. And being a just man, the Bible says, he doesn't want to do this publicly and shame her, but he's considering divorcing her quietly. Now, when we look at this term, betrothed, and as I said, he's set to marry this woman, right away, we're thinking engagement. Because that's the way our culture handles the marriage covenant, right? We say, hey, I like that girl. She likes me. You want to set a date? Let's date a little bit. Let's set a date. We'll get married. Well, there was a little bit more to it in the New Testament marriage covenant. You see, the betrothal process would have started with Joseph approaching Mary and her father with a list of covenant agreements. This was a list of things that he expected from Mary and her family and also a list of things that he was willing to give. And with this list came a dowry or a price to be paid for consideration. And then he went through the long, hard, nail-biting process of waiting to see if Mary would accept these covenant agreements. And if she accepted, then he was required by tradition and required by their laws to offer them gifts of appreciation for accepting the covenant terms. So as you can see, there was a lot of time, emotion, effort, and finance that went into this betrothal. Not only that, but legally, in the eyes of their country, Mary and Joseph were legally bound. She was already given to Joseph. So as a pregnancy in the midst of an engagement has the potential to ruin an engagement, a pregnancy in the midst of a betrothal is definitely going to ruin this betrothal. This, ladies and gentlemen, this people of God was a very big deal. Let's go on to, to, to verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
And once again, as we said in verse 18, this term, from the Holy Spirit, is a big term here in this passage. And we see it yet again just two verses later. So now let's take this opportunity to delve into that term, from the Holy Spirit. I want to divert your attention, if I could. This is the account of the angel of the Lord, or an angel of the Lord, not to be confused with the pre-incarnate Christ. This is simply a messenger from God, because it wouldn't make sense for Christ to come to Joseph and say, hey, I'm going to be born later. So this is just an angel of the Lord, not the angel of the Lord. As the angel of the Lord speaks to Joseph, we're going to take a second account here and, and look at what the same angel of the Lord, his account in speaking to Mary. Because not only does he appear to Joseph, but he appears to his wife as well. Let's take a look at that at Luke. I'm going to read Luke 1, 28 through 35, but on the screen here we'll post 34 for purpose. Luke 1, 28 and, Luke 1 and 28 reads as this. The angel went to her, her being Mary, and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And if I could have your attention on verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Further proof that at the birth of Christ, Mary was yet a virgin. And the angel answered, and this goes into answering the question we asked at the beginning. How did this come about? The angel gives us the answer. He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In that, in that last sentence there, there are two phrases that I want to direct your attention to. The first is, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, says the angel to Mary. That term overshadow in the Greek means to completely cover over, to engulf. So you see, it was not an intimate act that created Christ Jesus in Mary, but it was the power of the presence of God that completely surrounded, that completely took in Mary and created, this is an act of creation, created Christ Jesus within Mary. And in that, this proves that the Holy Spirit is God. Last week, we spoke with Brad, or Brad spoke with us, and he determined and he proved that Christ Jesus is God. And it wasn't such a hard job for Pastor Brian because he proved to us that God is God. But they told me, hey, could you prove the Holy Spirit is God? I said, okay, well, I'll go, I'll tackle that. The Holy Spirit is God because only God has the ability to create life. And the Holy Spirit created the life of Christ Jesus within Mary. And if that's not enough evidence for you, just flip to the beginning of your Bible, look at Genesis 1, and Genesis 1 says, in the beginning the earth was void and formless. And the Spirit of God hovered above the deep. The Spirit of God. Old Testament terminology for the Holy Spirit. There the Holy Spirit is right at the beginning. Only God exists from the beginning and has the ability to give life. We've just discovered the Holy Spirit existed from the beginning and has the ability to give life. The Holy Spirit is God. Now, this whole spill about the Holy Spirit creating Jesus within Mary may be a new concept. So I want to prove that by the Bible, because the best proof for the Bible is, I guess, the Bible. Take a, a wild shot in the dark here. I guess the best proof for the Bible is the Bible. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 says this.
Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. That very first verse, Jesus says, as he comes to earth, as, he's, as he comes here physically, he says to God, you have prepared, you have fashioned, you have created a body for me. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, created Christ Jesus' body, his physical form, within Mary. It's here in the scripture. Let's move forward, Let's move forward to verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The very first four words in that verse, she will bear a son, is indicative that Christ Jesus is the son of Mary. Well, we just talked in the last verse, and we just discussed that Christ Jesus is the son of God. But the very next verse identifies Christ Jesus as the son of Mary. Why is that important? Why is that impactful? Because Christ Jesus being the son of God makes him God. The son of a tiger happens to be a tiger. The son of a duck is a duck. The son of God, the very one and only son of God is God himself. But then again, we read that Mary bore a son who was also this son of God. And this son of God being born of Mary shows that he is 100% God, 100% human. God and man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, came here to dwell among us, to live with us, and he was God in the flesh. I want to uh, uh, turn your attention just briefly to Hebrews 4 and 15. We won't jump around too much. We're going to stick either in Hebrews or here. The book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in the, first, the 15th verse says this. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You see, Christ Jesus gets it. Because oftentimes, as human beings, we are very sporadic and very unsure about taking advice from someone that is not familiar with our situation. Because we would feel as though, if you've never struggled with addiction, what advice could you really give me in addiction? If you've never lost a loved one, if you've never lost your wife or your mother or your father, what advice could you truly give me on how it feels to lose a wife, a mother, a father, a loved one? And you see, Jesus Christ knew this about us. So for that reason, he comes to visit us as a man, and he gets it. Because just as we are tempted, we can't say, God, you don't understand what it is to be tempted. Well, even though God can't be tempted, God placed himself in the flesh as Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was tempted. So now there's an understanding of what we go through as men. But Christ gives us the perfect example. Yet being tempted was without sin. He didn't succumb to temptation. And not only does he relate to us on the temptation side, but he relates to us a little bit deeper. It reminds me of a little bit over a week ago, I got a chance to speak with a gentleman from seminary, and he happens to be the grandson of a man who is having a documentary filmed about him. And the reason he's having this documentary filmed is because he served 20 years in prison for a murder that he was later found not guilty of. You talk about a dollar short, a minute late. This guy served 20 years in prison for murder that he was discovered later to not be the, the, the guilty party. 
And one thing that this gentleman tells me that his grandfather says to him quite often is, although I never killed anyone, I know how it feels to be treated like a murderer because I served his punishment. And you see, Christ Jesus suffered on the cross and died for us. And although he wasn't guilty of any of our sins, he knows how it feels to be treated like the sinners, like us. He knows how that feels because he suffered our punishment. And so can I tell you, Christ Jesus gets it. And for me, this is a huge relief. For me, this was foundational in my life turn because I was once there. I was once of that mindset growing up living without my mom who died when I was three, without a father who I don't remember. I grew up seeing kids with their parents that looked like them, that walked like them, that talked like them. And I thought, wow, will anyone understand me? And I turned to gangs and I turned to drugs and I turned to alcohol to make myself feel like I belonged because I succumbed to temptation because I figured that there was no one who could relate and then I discovered Hebrews 4 15 Jesus gets it he was tempted just like I'm tempted he was there he understands what it is to go through everything that I went through and he suffered my punishment so, I was blessed enough to say toodaloo, goodbye to gangs, to drugs, and to alcohol through the free power of Christ Jesus. <laughs> Verse 22 and 23 work together. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, there's no better way to finish a passage than with a prophecy of the Messiah. Now, this prophecy highlights Isaiah 7:14. This prophecy that is mentioned in Matthew is found also in Isaiah 7:14. Now, this gives us one of the three reasons why we can believe that Christ Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit through the Virgin Mary. The first reason was, as we read, an angel, which is a dependable messenger, an angel himself appears to Joseph and to Mary and says, now here immediately your wife will be pregnant. She will conceive by the Holy Spirit, a credible messenger with a credible message. Now, on the other hand, if it would have said a retired mob boss came to Mary and Joseph and said, hey, I got an offer you can't refuse. We're going to have a virgin birth, bada boom, bada bing, John 3, 16. <laughs> then we could say, well, maybe that's not a credible messenger. May I don't know if I would believe that. That, that maybe doesn't work. But an angel himself comes to Mary and comes to Joseph, and this is a credible messenger. Number two, we believe that this word of God is God's infallible, unmistakable word of truth. And so if we as believers believe that God's word is infallible and unmistakable, then we must believe, according to Scripture, that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary through the Holy Spirit. And if that's still not good enough for you, which it should be, but if it's not good enough for you, we just read here in the 23rd verse, according to Isaiah 7:14, Jesus' birth was predicted hundreds of years before it happened. Hundreds of, year, hundreds of years before he was born, this was predicted. This was prophesied. And this prophecy from Isaiah 7, 14 happens to be one that has what's called a dual fulfillment. You see, because Isaiah made this prophecy during the time or during the reign of King Ahaz. And Isaiah took to himself a second wife who at the time was a virgin and the original, the original text of this prophecy gives kind of an immediate, 
urgent kind of language. So King Ahaz would have thought in reading this prophecy, this is going to happen right away. But right away, the prophet, who was Isaiah, took a second wife unto himself, who was a virgin, who eventually bore a child. And so the initial fulfillment was a foreshadow or was a type of the ultimate fulfillment, which was the Virgin Mary conceiving Christ Jesus. So a dual fulfillment takes place here in Isaiah 7, 14, and we read it in Matthew 23, 22, and 23. Now I want to go through and I want to tie up a few ends. I want to iron a few things out. I want to make sure that we have a strong grasp on the two questions that we posed at the beginning. The first question was, how did this happen? How did this come about? Well, as we just look through scripture, the simplified summative answer to that would be, Christ Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary through the Holy Spirit because the power of God overshadowed, engulfed Mary, and through the Holy Spirit, God himself created Jesus within Mary. What does this mean for me today? I want to discuss that question just a little bit because we didn't spend as much time discussing that one. You see, as we look at the life of the Virgin Mary, as we look at the whole, the entirety of Virgin Mary's life, Mary parallels our lives as believers. She serves as a great example, a great parallel of how we live our lives as believers. How's that, you say? Well, Mary being a virgin and being implanted with Christ or having Christ living and growing within her gives us a good example of how we too have Christ within our hearts. Because since Christ says, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly, and then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Christ tells us in no uncertain terms, my desire is to live within you. And Christ Jesus lived and grew within Mary. But there was not a man who could have come together with Mary to produce Christ Jesus within her. There was no intimate act. There was no other human being alive that could have come together with Mary to produce Christ Jesus. Just as in the life of the believer, there is no man alive. There is no preacher. There is no teacher. There is no counselor that can place Jesus in your heart. It was the working of the Holy Spirit that placed Jesus within Mary. It is the working of the Holy Spirit that will place Jesus into your and my heart. It is the very working of God through the power of the Holy Spirit that allowed Mary to achieve the miraculous. And there's, there's an amazing thing that happens when when. A woman is with child. This this amazing thing happens. And that is, eventually, it becomes evident. You know, there there is not a woman that can say, all right, now I'm six months, I'm seven months, I'm showing, hey, baby in there, can you go back to two months and I want to get my body back? It's not possible. It won't happen. There's not a woman that can do that. And if there is, I want to meet you after service. We're going to the circus. I'm going to be your manager. It is not possible to say, hey, could you please retract a little bit? So Mary, being, having Jesus Christ living and growing within her, eventually was obviously pregnant with child. And so too with us as believers. As Jesus Christ lives within us, and, ha- and as his voice becomes stronger, and as his lead becomes stronger, and as we submit more and more to him in our lives, we too become noticeably with Christ. It becomes obvious. There's there's usually not a guess. And I'm not the best example of this, but I'll give you an example of that God happened to allow me to experience. I was giving my wife a break, and she was home relaxing or talking on the phone or doing whatever women do when husbands aren't around. We don't know. And I said, I'll take the kids to the grocery store. So I have 
Tyus and Serenity with me in the grocery store, and I'm trying to grocery shop, but I'm just chasing kids at this point. And a gentleman comes up to me, and he says, hey, are you a believer? I said, yeah. How'd you know? He said, well, just the way you related with your kids and, and just the way you carried yourself, I figured, I thought that you were a believer. And I said, wow, was it the way I ran? And did I have like a, a Jesus sprint after the kids, you know? Was it that? No, but he comes up to me and he says, hey, are you a believer? And for me, that was such a humbling experience. Just some passerby in the grocery store asking a simple question. But this spurred me to say, wow, God, you're excellent. Because as we live and as we continue to allow Christ to grow within us, as I said before, it becomes obvious that you're with Christ. It becomes obvious that he lives within you. So as you grow and as you submit to, himself, to, to Christ Jesus himself, we become like Mary, who later on in that same passage that we read from Luke, later on Mary says to the angel, well, if this decision is from God, God, I am your servant, and let it be done as you said. You see, Mary once again serves as a great example for us as believers because she was completely submitted to the Holy Spirit, to the power of God. And guess what? Because that was her decision, because she made that decision, she was able to experience the miraculous within herself. And so I'll present this challenge to you. Will you completely surrender, submit yourself to God the Father? through Christ Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you completely surrender yourself, as did Mary, I'm your servant, let it be done like you said? Because once you make that decision, you have the, the privilege to take in the miraculous within yourself. To answer the two questions we, we asked at the beginning, how did this take place? Well. We read through scripture, we got a summative idea of how this took place. What does this mean for me today? What does this mean for you today? That takes us back to the very title of the message. Because once you submit yourself to God the Father in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, once you are completely submitted and have given yourself to him, then and only then can you proclaim this section of the Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed in its entirety, then and then, then and only then, can you proclaim, I believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. Amen? Let's pray.